Hello, everyone. Hope you're doing well today. So this past week was pretty special as we had a total solar eclipse in the States on Monday. It's something that we won't see in the States for another 20 years. So I got home a little early from work to share this special moment with my kids and my family. I brought the little glasses home and I told her how cool this is going to be. So I put the glasses on her and she took one look up at the sun and said, okay, dad, can I go now? <laughs> So clearly she didn't think it was as cool as I thought it was, but I still think it was a pretty special experience for my family. Let me know in the chat or comments what you were doing during the eclipse. For those of us in the New England area that would like to grow in their leadership, our Watertown campus will be host, will be host site for the Global Leadership Summit, a two-day leadership development conference featuring acclaimed speakers on a wide range of leadership topics. The dates are August 8th and 9th from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. And the early bird pricing is $139, and that'll last until May 8th. You can go to grace.org slash GLS for more information. Today, we'll be starting a really special sermon series, a very personal one for Pastor Brian, as this will be his last sermon series as the senior pastor of Grace Chapel. Speaking of, the online campus will be doing a ice cream social on Zoom in July as a way to celebrate Pastor Brian and his years of leading Grace Chapel so keep a lookout for more information about that. But before we go into a time of musical worship and start this new sermon series, let's take a moment to pray together. God, we thank you so much for this day, uh, for this opportunity to hear your word. We thank you so much for the special sermon series that Pastor Brian has prepared, his last sermon series as a senior pastor of Grace Chapel. We pray that as he speaks these words and as he speaks upon his years and years of experience as a pastor and as a leader, I pray that our hearts would be ready to receive it, to be transformed, to be amazed by you. Thank you so much, Lord. And would you meet us wherever we are? In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
I've been running for a long time, my whole life practically. And most of the time, I love it. Being outdoors, finding a rhythm, freeing my mind and spirit. Some days are rough though. It's cold or hot or pouring rain. I'm tired, my knee hurts. You just have to press through sometimes, one foot in front of the other. And every time, I'm glad I did. I could say the same about faith. I've been believing a long time, my whole life practically. And most of the time, I love it. A God who loves me and speaks to me through the scriptures, belonging to this remarkable community called the church, learning to live and love like Jesus. Some days are rough though. Stuff happens. God seems distant. Christians say and do stupid things, including me. You just have to press through sometimes, one question or struggle after another. And every time, I'm glad I did. So I'm still at it, still running, still believing, still growing and grateful. When our digital team first brought me the idea for that bumper video, I thought it was a terrible idea. No one wants to watch a skinny old guy tie his shoes and go lumbering down the road. But as so often happens around here, my teammates were onto something. Distance running turns out to be a pretty good metaphor for the faith journey. You have these extended stretches of exhilaration and flow when you feel like you could keep going forever interspersed with bouts of tedium and pain and the almost irresistible urge to quit. And after a lifetime of experiencing all of that, I'm still running and still believing. So as uncomfortable as it is for me to watch, it's a pretty good setup for the series. And here's the fun part. When we came up with the idea months ago, it never occurred to us that we'd be premiering the video on Marathon Weekend. <laughs> I love when that happens. So over the course of the next four weeks, I'd like to share with you why after a lifetime of following Jesus and 40 years as a pastor, I believe as strongly as ever in God, in the Bible, in the gospel of Jesus Christ, and in the local church. Now, some of what I share will probably sound familiar to those of you who've been listening to me for a while, but I don't want to miss one last chance to affirm some foundational truths as we look to the future, and I don't want to miss a chance to speak into the challenging and deconstructing conversations that are happening in the church today, especially among younger generations. Now, along the way, I'll also be sharing some of the ways my beliefs have matured and even changed over the years. Because while I still believe in God, the Bible, the gospel, and the church, I may not believe in exactly the same way I did 40 years ago. As most of you know, I really have been believing my whole life. I was born into a pastor's family and publicly professed faith in Christ at five years old. And since that time, I have, I have never known a day without a conscious awareness of God the Bible, the gospel, and the church. And I can honestly say that most of those days and years have been characterized by exhilaration and flow and a sense of God's presence. But you don't make it through 60-some years of life and faith without encountering seasons of tedium and pain and the occasional urge to quit. And I've shared some of those difficulties uh, with you over the years. Uh, the first one came as a teenager, when I realized my faith in Christ would lead me in a different direction than many of my friends in terms of lifestyle and choices. It was the era of sex and drugs and rock and roll, and at least the two of those were going to be off limits for me. It forced me to question my faith. Was it real and personal? Or had it simply been handed to me by my parents and my church? I pretty much dared God to show up in my life, to make himself real to me, or I might just walk away. 
Some years later, as a senior in college, having spent four years preparing for a life in youth ministry, I had my first experience with existential doubt. I was sitting in chapel when they announced that a flash flood had roared through a small Bible college in Toccoa Falls, Georgia, destroying much of the campus and claiming the lives of several faculty members and students. It felt like a kick in the gut. What gives God? I remember thinking. If you can't even protect a humble community of your servants, what kind of God are you? And how can I represent you? Well, years later, in my work as a pastor, I found myself coming alongside people through the worst kinds of life experiences, tragic losses, devastating diseases, family dysfunction, crushing depression, deaths of despair. How could their faith and mine stand in the face of such heartache and disappointment? Then there was the New Atheist Movement. Skeptics like Richard Dawkins and Sam Harris and Christopher Hitchens are launching blistering attacks on the Christian faith, writing books with titles like The God Delusion, The End of Faith, and God is not great. Could the Christian faith withstand the critique of science and reason? Then there was my dark night of the soul. Just after my 40th birthday, with everything going great in life and ministry, the bottom dropped out of my faith. And suddenly I wasn't sure what or if I believed anymore. God was silent, distant, absent, and if I didn't believe anymore, how could I help others believe? I dropped out for three months, not knowing if I would ever come back. And in these later years, I've been deeply troubled by the bad behavior of people and communities who profess to be followers of Jesus. Judgmentalism, legalism, divisiveness, moral failure, toxic leadership, political compromise. Do I really want to be part of this thing called Christianity and church? All this to say, I've seen a lot in 40 years of ministry, the good, the bad, and the ugly, up close and personal. And any one of these difficulties, let alone all of them, would be reason enough for giving up, for walking away. And yet, here I am, still believing still helping others believe. Why? That's the question I'd like to answer over the next four weeks. And today I'd like to begin by telling you why I still believe in God, and specifically in a God who loves us. For the next few minutes, I'd like us to consider four lines of evidence, two troublesome questions, and one new learning. I'm going to paint in broad strokes this morning, having, having gone into detail on these things in many previous sermons. My purpose today isn't so much to convince you of something, but to encourage you to press into your own journey, to bring your doubts and difficulties to Jesus, as we learned from Thomas last week. So let's begin with four lines of evidence for believing in God. Now, I think we all understand that we can't prove the existence or non-existence of God. Both are metaphysical propositions that can't be empirically verified by data or research. Understand that both theism and atheism require belief, a leap of faith. There are lines of evidence and arguments to consider, but in the end, we have to decide which belief best accounts for the evidence with the least amount of difficulty. It's a variation on the philosophical principle known as Occam's razor, which suggests that the simplest explanation of something is probably the best explanation. So with that principle in mind, let's consider the best and simplest explanation for four lines of evidence. The first being the natural world. How do we explain the existence of everything around us? The universe, the earth, 
flora and fauna, human beings? How do we explain not just the existence of the natural world, but the beauty and order and vitality of the natural world? Uh, To frame it in classic philosophical constructs, why is there something rather than nothing? The universe exists, but why? How did it get here? Why is there order rather than chaos? Why are there laws like gravity that govern the universe? Why can we predict with absolute precision a total eclipse of the sun? Why is there life instead of just matter? Rocks exist, but they don't live. Why? Why do some things eat? and breathe, and grow, and reproduce of their own accord? And why are there persons instead of just creatures? Where did human beings get the capacity to to think, to love, to create, to play golf? Why is there golf anyway? That's a good question. So what's the simplest, most reasonable explanation for the existence of a beautiful, orderly, personal, life-sustaining world. We really only have two options. Either it was all created, brought into being by a beautiful, orderly, personal being, or it just happened, random, accidentally, from nothing, with no cause or purpose or design. Which is the more reasonable explanation. Scientists who would would seem to be in the best position to answer this question are pretty evenly divided on the answer. Uh, Surveys consistently reveal that at least half, if not more than half, of all scientists describe themselves as people of faith, who who, who believe in, in a creator God. And even those who don't, like the late great Stephen Hawking, Uh, Often, they seem conflicted at times. More than once, Hawking, the self-described atheist, acknowledged the evidence for a creator. It would be very difficult to explain why the universe would have begun in just this way, except as the act of a God who intended to create beings like us, he once said. The general population heavily favors the God hypothesis, with about 80% of Americans professing faith in a higher power. The Bible answers the question this way. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of His hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they declare knowledge. There is no speech or language where their voice is not heard. It's interesting that we're reading these verses days after an eclipse that had millions of people staring into the heavens, pondering the why and the how and the meaning of what they were seeing and feeling. The heavens do that. Now, recently, I, I read an account of a mountain climber hanging off the north face of Mount Everest, watching the sun come up. And she found herself feeling connected to something much bigger than herself, something that she believed loved her, she said. Well, there's lots more we could say about all of this. But for me, personally, having lived in and explored this beautiful world for nearly seven decades, having studied the various theories for the origins of the universe, having spent time with lots of scientists in our congregation and here in greater Boston, I find the existence of a personal, powerful God to be the most reasonable explanation for the natural world. And not only the most reasonable explanation, but the most satisfying explanation. Because it it, it makes our experience of the natural world all the more meaningful and all the more personal when we know the person and the purpose behind it all. Well, a second line of evidence is the human heart, specifically the longings and capacities 
of the human heart. For instance, how do we explain our longing for justice and morality? Why is there universal agreement that lying and stealing and betrayal are wrong? Why do we bristle when things aren't fair? Why aren't ethical choices simply a matter of what works and what doesn't work? In his book, The Reason for God, Tim Keller points us to the work of Annie Dillard, a spiritual writer who spent a year living in the Virginia wilderness, only to discover, to her dismay, that violence always wins in the natural world. The strong overpower the weak. If human existence is random and pointless, she asks, if human beings are simply highly evolved creatures, and if that evolution hinges on the survival of the fittest, why should it bother us when humans act violently toward one another in an attempt to secure their own survival or pleasure or advancement? And conversely, how do we explain acts of altruism and self-sacrifice, which jeopardize our own survival and advancement. And how about the longing for love, for intimacy, for loyalty? These things complicate our lives. They limit our options. They leave us vulnerable to those who might hurt us or take advantage of us. So why do we seek them? And how about the longing for transcendence? They tell us that during the eclipse on Monday, the birds got quiet and the animals went still, which is certainly interesting. But they didn't put on glasses and stare into the heavens. They didn't gather in groups to watch and ask questions and ponder their place in the universe. Why do we do that? Why do we yearn, as Cosmo Kramer asks? I did a funeral last weekend for someone I had known many years ago, but had lost touch with in recent years. I conducted the service at the funeral home, which was packed with friends and neighbors, many of whom didn't strike me as religiously devout people. But when I called them together to share a few thoughts and prayers, I was struck by how intently this room full of strangers were looking at me, the reverend, as if they were desperate for some sense of perspective on this loss, some words of promise that this earthly life isn't all there is, that the pictures on the wall, the memories in their hearts weren't all that was left of their friend. But why? If this earthly life is all there is, as the atheist or naturalist believes, why do we long for more? Why does everything in us look for a life to come? I actually read to them from the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 3. God has made everything beautiful in its time. He has also set eternity in the human heart. I know there is nothing better for people than to be happy and do good while they live that each of them may eat and drink and find satisfaction in all their toil. This is the gift of God. Why do we long for morality, for love, for meaning, for eternity? The simplest explanation seems to me, the most reasonable explanation, is that those longings were placed there by a good and loving and purposeful and eternal God who made us in his image. Well, a third line of evidence is the historical record. Now, we'll talk more about this in the weeks to come, but enough for now to point out that belief in a God who loves us isn't just a metaphysical concept we pulled out of thin air. It, it, it's grounded in historical realities places you can find on a map, dates you can place on a calendar, names and events that show up in ancient histories and archaeological records. For instance, a, 
A variety of ancient mythologies and cosmologies describe some sort of catastrophic flood that, that changed the landscape. The Egyptian Empire really used enslaved people groups like the Hebrews to build their monuments. The cities we read about in the Old Testament still exist today, Jericho, Hazor, Jerusalem. Most secular historians will acknowledge that someone named Jesus of Nazareth actually lived, that he said and did remarkable things, was executed by Rome, and was alleged to have risen from the dead. There's the emergence of the Christian faith and church almost overnight, with no plausible explanation apart from a catalytic and transformative event, like, say, a resurrection. Now, the details of all those events, the records we have of them, can all be debated and scrutinized. Certainly there are gaps and discrepancies in the historical and archaeological records, but the point is, things happened. Things that have changed the course of history. Things that point to the existence and activity of a God who loves us. Now, while people may want to debate the details of what happened, it's hard to argue that they never happened. Think of it this way. There's a traffic jam on Route 28 near the Woburn Interchange. Now, according to one report, there was a collision between a truck and a car. According to another, it was actually a tractor trailer that overturned on the entrance ramp to Route 93. A third report says it was caused by a flock of turkeys crossing the highway during rush hour. Now, for sure, there are loose ends and discrepancies that need to be tracked down and straightened out to get to the heart of the story. More information is needed. But which conclusion is more reasonable? That nothing happened and the whole thing was a fiction? Or that something happened and we just haven't put all the pieces together yet? So personally, having considered the biblical and non-biblical accounts of earth-changing history-making, and even supernatural events, especially those concerning Jesus of Nazareth, I believe the most reasonable conclusion is that something happened. Some things happened. Things that can best be explained by the activity and intervention of a God who loves us. Well, a final line of evidence is personal experience. First, there's the personal experience of billions of people, people of every era, culture, religion, and walk of life, who claim to have experienced life-changing encounters with a higher power or a supreme being. Now, granted, there's great diversity of those experiences and beliefs, and, and we'll talk about those in a minute. But as we suggested in our discussion of the historical record, it's a more reasonable conclude that billions of people have experienced something that isn't real or that doesn't exist? Or is it more reasonable conclude that a higher power or being really does exist and can be experienced? No, no one refutes the fact that human beings are incurably religious. But why? if there's nothing religious or spiritual out there. As Tim Keller likes to point out, it's, it's almost impossible not to think about God. Even those who deny the existence of God are implicitly acknowledging the concept of God. But why? Where does that come from? But as intriguing as the billions of personal experiences are, the experience that means the most to me is mine. Again and again, in all kinds of ways, I have personally experienced what I believe to be the presence and power of a God who loves me. A God who has granted me strength and comfort and wisdom and joy and hope and love beyond measure. A, a God who I believe has intervened in my life and the lives of those I love and serve to heal and restore and deliver and make new. You've heard me tell enough of those stories over the years that I don't need to start listing them right now. 
So when I consider these four lines of evidence, the beauty and order of the natural world, the deep longings of the human heart, the historical record, especially concerning Jesus of Nazareth, and the personal experience of billions of people, including me, I've come to believe that there really is a God who loves us. <laughs> and to answer the question we raised at the beginning, I believe the existence of that God best explains the evidence with the least amount of difficulties. Are there still difficulties? Yes. And briefly, I'd like to talk about two of them. The first is the problem of evil and suffering. If God exists and that God loves us, why is there so much evil and suffering in the world? It's a troublesome question, not just intellectually, but, but personally. We've all been touched by evil and suffering. And volumes have been written on the subject. But the question still haunts us. How do we reconcile evil and suffering with the existence of a good and loving God? Well, two thoughts in response. My first thought is that we have brought most of it on ourselves. That good and loving God has granted us freedom, and we have exercised that freedom poorly. The vast majority of suffering in the world can be traced to the foolishness, selfishness, and wickedness of human beings toward one another and toward the world God has entrusted to us. Poverty, war, injustice, oppression, abuse, tyranny, these are things that people inflict on each other. Why do we blame God for what our hands have done? Now, could God stop it? Yes, but only by taking away our freedom including your freedom to make your own choices in life, because every one of those choices will have a positive or negative impact on the people and world around you. And, and, and while there, there are natural disasters and diseases that are not directly caused by humans, the suffering that ensues is often exacerbated by human foolishness and evil. And even those aberrations of disaster and disease can ultimately be traced to the fallenness of our race and our world. So my first response to the problem of evil and suffering is that we have brought most of it on ourselves. And my second response is that not believing in God doesn't solve the problem of suffering and evil. In fact, it makes it worse. And not only is evil and suffering still with us, if there's no God, there's no source of strength or comfort or help beyond ourselves. If there's no God, there's no possibility of divine intervention to relieve that suffering or to bring something good out of it. If there's no God, there's no hope for vindication or restoration in the life to come. If there's no God, then suffering is pointless, evil wins, and death has the last word. And everything in us rebels against those ideas. If, on the other hand, there is a God who promises to be with us in our suffering and redeem it for good, who's actually entered into our suffering to share it and defeat it, well, then we have reason and resources to face that suffering and evil with courage and strength and hope. So as troublesome as the problem of suffering and evil is, it's even more troublesome if God doesn't exist. A second troublesome question is what about other religions? There are a multitude of belief systems and while there's likely some truth in all of them, many of them offer competing and even 
contradictory views of God. Some say God is one. Others say God is many. Some say God is in everything. Others say everything is an illusion. So logically, they can't all be true. But does that mean none of them are true and that there is no God? Or is it more reasonable to conclude, as we did with the traffic jam on 128, that, that we have to sort through the options and decide which belief system best accounts for the evidence with the least amount of difficulties? Or as Tim Keller once put it, which belief system has the most explanatory power to make sense out of what we see in the world and in ourselves? Well, the Apostle Paul actually confronts that very question when he's speaking to a group of thoughtful people in the city of Athens, gathered for what looks like an ancient version of a, of a TED conference. Uh, the book of Acts tells us that after looking and listening for a while, Paul stood up among them and said, People of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, to an unknown God. Now what you worship as something unknown, I am going to proclaim to you. Paul wasn't bothered by the fact that there were many views of God. That was simply evidence that there was a God to be sought after and found. And from that starting point, he points them to the God they were looking for. He says, The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by hands. He himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. From one man he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. And that's the explanatory power Tim Keller was talking about. Belief in a God who loves us not only explains the origins of the universe and the world as we know it, it actually helps us make sense out of the entire breadth of human experience. It speaks to all the questions and longings of the human heart. As C.S. Lewis famously put it, I believe in Christianity as I believe that the sun has risen, not only because I see it, but because by it, I see everything else. And for similar reasons, in spite of all the obstacles I've encountered in my 60-some years of life and 40 years of ministry, all the doubts and difficulties and disappointments and dark nights, I still believe in a God who loves us. In fact, I've come to believe that God loves us even more than I once dared to ask or imagine. <laughs> and that's the new learning I promised you, a continuing development in my faith. I still believe in a God who loves us more than I dare to ask or imagine. Now, let me explain what I mean. I've always believed that God loves us. I was singing, Jesus loves me, this I know, before I even knew what the words meant. But for a long time, I'm afraid, I had the idea that God loved some of us more than others. And that even though he loved everybody, he especially loved Christians, especially Christians who are Baptists, and extra especially those who were conservative Baptists, because that's what we were. <laughs> and being an American, I couldn't help but think that while God certainly loved all the nations of the world, he had a special place in his heart for our nation. And being a good church kid, I couldn't shake the feeling that God loved me more than he loved the bullies and the troublemakers at school and that he loved me more when I was good, when I was reading my Bible and telling the truth and being kind to the uncool kids. 
Now, those weren't always conscious convictions. I'm not sure I would have said any of them out loud. But I have a feeling those thoughts shape my faith more deeply and far longer than I care to admit, with vestiges of them lingering well into my adult years. In my later years, I have come to believe that God's love is far more expansive, far more inclusive, and far more gracious than I ever dared to imagine. That he loves Buddhists and Muslims and Hindus and atheists just as much as he loves Christians. That he loves Asians and Africans and North Americans and South Americans all the same. That he loves straight people and queer people and religious people and irreligious people and good people and bad people and even wicked people. He loves us when we're flourishing in our faith and he loves us when we're struggling with our faith. He loves us so much that he's made himself known to us. Not only in the natural world as we've talked about today, but through the scriptures and through his son Jesus, who came into the world to show us that love. And we'll talk more about all that in the weeks to come. He loves us so much that he invites each of us, all of us, every human being into a personal relationship with him for this life and the life to come. A relationship characterized by meaning and purpose and connection and joy. But he also loves us, loves us enough to let us ignore him and resist him and even to walk away from him for this life and the life to come. So if you're struggling with faith these days, if you're finding it hard to believe for any of the reasons we mentioned today, let me encourage you not to quit. Because after a lifetime of running and believing, I've learned that sometimes you just have to press through. You have to keep putting one foot in front of the other and wait for that second wind, that wind of the Spirit to find you and fill you and bring you home. God met me in every one of those troubling seasons I described, and I am confident He will meet you too. So keep bringing your doubts and questions to Jesus. Keep considering these four lines of evidence. Keep wrestling with these troubling questions. Keep looking and listening for God as you make your way through this world, because as it turns out, he is not far from each one of us. Why don't we take a quiet moment each of us, to tell the Lord where we are on our journey these days and invite him to meet us there. Take a moment to do that, and then I'll pray. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to think about all these things today. Thank you for the world you've made, the many ways it points us toward you. Thank you for the hearts you've placed within us, hearts that yearn for love and justice and meaning and more. Thank you for the record you have left of your presence and activity in the world, and especially for the life of Jesus. Thank you for the promise that if we seek you, and reach out for you. We will find you, and you will find us. May it be so, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen.
With no point of reference You spoke to the dark And fleshed out the wonder of light And as you
you would again a hundred billion times But what measure could amount to your desire You're the one who never leaves the one behind Thank you so much for joining us today. And hopefully if it's a little bit nicer out next week, you might see us outside. Go in peace.